He has led multinational companies in regional geographies and sectors of mobility, mass, automotive, energy, and digital infrastructure and M&A. He is known for his strong strategic leadership and entrepreneurial st uh, spirit, positioning companies to establish brand, develop startups, grow, and reach customers and partners. And of course, to build the capabilities that ensure long-term success. Well, I'm talking about none other than Shri Mangal Dev, Head Hitachi Rail Systems India and South Asia and Director Hitachi India Private Limited. Everybody, please put your hands together. Can I request Mr. Narendra Shah to kindly come up on the stage to welcome the guest uh, with a flower bouquet? Can we have you here, sir? Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for giving your precious time. It matters a lot. Thank you. Well, now I would like to call a person who is a highly experienced senior director for the transit business for of the Vaptec Corporation in India. With over 25 years of work experience in the rail transportation industry, he has had, held diverse leadership roles with multinational companies such as ABB, Bombardier Transportation, Alstom Transport and Webtech Group. He has held a gold medal in physics uh, from Presidency College, Kolkata and an electrical uh, engineering degree from the University of Kolkata. He also holds established credentials in customer relationship management from the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. I am talking about Sri Preetam Ganguly, Senior Director, Sales and Marketing, MA. Everybody, please put your hands together for him as well. Very glad to have you on board with us. Can I again request Mr. Narin Shah to welcome the guest with the bouquet of flowers? All right, now I would like to call uh, a person who has completed B.Tech plus M.Tech IDD in Material Science from IIT BHU in 2013. He joined Tata Steel as Management Trainee Technical in 2013 and was placed as Researcher R&D. Till now, during his tenure with Tata Steel, he has worked across various departments like R&D, Marketing and Sales and Engineering and Projects. He is none other than Mr. Bhardwaj Bhagwati, Head Railway Business, Tata Steel. Can we have you here, sir, on the stage, please? And would like to request Mr. Narin Shah to welcome him as well with the bouquet of flowers. Everyone, please give him a big hand. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for being here. So we have all the speakers on this stage. Now is the time when we call the moderator as well. He is a highly experienced mechanical officer of the Indian Railway with an exceptional and unmasked 38-year-old career in the field of rolling stock engineering and technology. He is best known as the mastermind behind the Vande Bharat Express train and was instrumental in ensuring that the train was delivered within a short duration of about 18 months only. He has extensive experience in rail rolling stock design, manufacture and maintenance, as well as the locomotive operations and railway heritage. He has also initiated several passenger amenities at stations, uh, stations and implemented environmental management, afforestation and green energy. 
He has held the various positions in the Indian Railways, including General Manager of Integral Coach Factory, ICF, Chennai, and Divisional Railway Manager. He is also a consultant rail uh, engineer, manager of various projects, author, opinion writer, art collector, and promoter, to note a few. I am talking about Mr. Siddhan Shumani, creator of train, uh, train 18, former GF, ICF consultant. Everybody, please put your hands together as he makes his way. Can I request Mr. Narendra Shah to kindly come up on the stage to welcome Mr. Sudhan Shuman. Well, I can have an idea that this particular session is going to be mind-blowing. It is going to be very informative, that's for sure. such known and knowledgeable speakers we have today on the board with us. We are looking forward to have a great uh, time with them. I would request all of you to be seated and kindly pay your full attention towards the stage as we move forward for the next panel of the day, which is having the theme as Make in India, Make Forward. Mic over to Mr. Sudan Shumani. Good evening, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, it's kind of fortunate that the hall is uh, half empty uh, because uh, I'm sure some of you have heard me speak and uh, have, would not have uh, tolerated old wine in new bottle. Of course, I do have this be belief that what I speak is like wine and wine is like men. men sometimes turn to vinegar but mostly mature with age so i think uh, what i do speak also matures with age but it is the love of mr uh, narendra shah that i'm here and not as a speaker but a mod as a moderator so it's a great change for me not to speak but to ask and listen uh, the subject is atmanirbhar it says indigenous export to India. I don't know what that means, but basically it means export out of India. Uh, so let me, I'll not go too much into my thoughts because we are here to listen to these gentlemen, uh, all stalwarts of industry. Uh, but I do say that we are somewhat lost between mindlessly global and uh, hopelessly local. The truth, to my mind, which stands to be qualified today or modified, is somewhere in between. Because I've been saying that a transfer of technology is largely an oxymoron. Uh, transfer of technology cannot take place because technology is a creation which lives in the mind as well as the heart of the creator. I can express it poeti poetically also, but I'm not going to do that today. Uh, my views are not important. What is important today is, as I said, these gentlemen sitting here, what do they think about it? And maybe we have, we stand a good chance to learn from them. Uh, I'll begin by making a statement that we are a large country. And in railway sector, we are now showing the signs of being a large country through uh, large scale investment. As you know, the capex has gone through the roof which gives us an opportunity to leverage the volumes. Leveraging the volumes for your own products first makes a background for then showcasing your products developed for your own and exporting them. Uh, I will start with you, Mr. Mangaldev. Is, uh, what is your understanding of the true spirit of Atmanirbhar? And how do you think India, given the expertise and the ecosystem in the private and public domain today and I underline private and public domain both because as you know there is a, if I can call it backdoor privatization of loading stock manufacturing on right now uh, so how can that be leveraged for uh, exporting so what you make out of Atmanirbhar and how do we well, thank export you. so to thank say you, thank you very much and thank you, Inno Metro, for uh, 
organizing this conference. I think uh, it's quite an apt time that we deliberate on these issues and uh, progress towards uh, growth of this country and also be truly Atmanirbhar and also uh, become global. So, in short, uh, what I believe, what is Atmanirbhar is that uh, having the potential of India that it is, whether it is being manifested and being leveraged, that is one, but there is a potential. And I think many companies, Indian and global, have identified and recognized that India has a potential. Be it the engineering, management, or different fields uh, and different sectors uh, that we may talk about. So there is a huge potential. And in some key areas, uh, India has demonstrated that uh, they can be world class. So when you have the potential and you can be world class, then what you need to become um, Atma Nirbhar is that when you have the complete control on the complete value chain of a particular system and let's say talk about rolling stock per se. So if you have, you know, right from the design concept stage to, uh, you know, converting that into the requirements and um, the usage, the outcome performance into a specification and from that to defining your train and then dividing to different um, subsystem manufacturing uh, together with your complete ecosystem, tier one, tier two, tier three, supply chain system. And then be able to validate, uh, to fulfill, fulfill those requirements and you know, make a train which can then be uh, a complete uh, train fulfilling those conditions that you set out with. So when you have a complete control on the value chain and that you are doing indigenously in India, I think that is truly, uh, for me, the Atmanirbhar uh, 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 outcome. And as I said, maybe we have taken a lot of time in becoming Atmanirbhar, but in many other sectors where I have been associated, and I always take example of Suzuki. So initially, of course, there was, uh, you know, components coming from Japan, assembly in India, and then slowly and slowly, you know, the different... Um, uh, processes became Indian and uh, from one factory to two and two to four and design engineering center. So eventually they have become Atmanirbhar. So that for me is quite a benchmark. And the day we are able to accomplish this in the railway sector in the, for the rolling stock, I think we would have achieved that Atmanirbharta. Thank you. Uh, so I'll come to you, Mr. Ganguly. So you heard what uh, Mr. Mangaldev has said. In kind of a, being a manufacturing hub in certain sectors, yes, we have done very well. He gave certain examples. Uh, do you think we can really be at Nirbhar, as per your understanding, just by becoming a factory of the world or a developer of products? Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Mr. Mani, for the question. It's a very pertinent one. So over the years, uh, we at Vaptec have always been a good, strong advocate of the Make in India policy of the government. So what really in our understanding is Atmanirbhar and what are we doing towards it? So for us, it's a combination of three things. The first is local manufacturing footprint. The second is source and get as self-reliant as possible in the business. So source from our develop suppliers in India and have a strong vendor base. And the third most important one, trying to answer what Mr. Mani has asked, is to develop competencies in engineering, which means that we understand what we do in India until the life cycle of the product that we actually develop. So some of the actions that we've taken at Vaptec uh, over the years has been not only having one million square feet of uh, footprint with six factories, but also, you know, to have products with over 70% local content. We're still not there. We need to be much higher. But that's where we've reached over the years. And what has brought us success and cost competitiveness is this quote-unquote Atmanidbar, what we speak about. And that's how we have developed an engineering center with competencies in R&D who are able to not only bring in global technology at the most competitive prices, 
but also independently customize the products to meet the requirements of the Indian market. So be it rolling stock, for example, electric locomotives, coaches, semi-high speed train sets, are the different segments of rolling stock where the investment is on and our energies and brains are towards how we can make these areas competitive, developed in India, sourced from India, and then move to the next step, which is manufacture from India for the world. So that's a two-pronged strategy for us to be Atmanirbhar. It doesn't happen very quickly unless we have a business strategy which is clear. So linking that with the business strategy, we not only want to grow organically, but also inorganically through strategic acquisitions and by building capacities in different areas that we operate in. Thank you. So, Mr. Bhagwati, we have heard uh, these two gentlemen. Of course, it comes a little bit from the perspective of uh, multinationals. But Tata's have a big legacy of developing Indian products. So how would you define Aat Nirbhar and uh, how can the volumes in the rolling stock sector be leveraged for India to become a global player? Uh, not these exports that we do against Indian line of credit today. A global pair by exporting large number of rolling stock against competitive bidding. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the question. Hello? Yeah. Thank you so much for the question. And also a warm welcome to everybody present here. Uh, I would like to take the question in two parts. Hello? Yeah, thank you, thank you. I'd like to organize my thoughts in two parts. One is the first part of the question where you spoke about what is our understanding of being Atmanirbhar. The second part would be how do we leverage it into becoming a global force. So when we talk about Atmanirbhar, I think uh, both the other speakers have also covered it quite at length. The very key part is owning the value chain of either you're manufacturing or providing a service as much as possible. That is the immediate uh, definition or the kind of thought process we think of when we are, we are Atmanirbhar. But in today's world, if we see certain parts of the value chain, whether you like it or not, you have to be dependent on, uh, on how the globalized world is set up. Say today India is a net importer of oil. No matter how much we, we like it, we cannot have those kind of oil reserves at the very beginning of the value chain. Even if we want to control and completely have the uh, Atmanirbha set up here, on certain things we still ha have to. Like uh, even Tata Steel, when we manufacture, go for our iron making and steel making, India has a lot of coal reserves. But the coal reserves in India do not have the quality of coking required to produce the same level of uh, steel. Uh, the efficiency goes down because of the ash content. So we are dependent on a coal that's imported from Australia or elsewhere. But that is one part of it. So even though we are dependent on that, what we truly believe to, for us to be Atmanirbhar is to still be able to identify which parts of value chain we control and also design and develop solutions and products for the local domestic requirement. It should not be a product that's uh, immediately brought in and retrofitted uh, for the domestic requirement. Atmanirbhar. So we also like to see the end uh, stakeholder, the final consumer, as also be part of the complete value chain. So owning that whole, even though we may not own parts of it, but when we are able to see a vision that, okay, this is what is required, and we deliver on that, whether by owning the engineering or the most critical chain, that is what we feel is a vision of being truly Atmanirbha. And uh, sorry, the second part of it, how do we have a global force? Definitely, uh, rolling stock, uh, as you have also touched upon, it's something we're heavily invested in as a country, and we are taking huge strides today. Uh, and the process of uh, how we have seen other economies also develop over time is that the process of becoming export-oriented economy starts from first you start the import substitution, then you go to self-sufficiency, and then you start exports. So I feel India today is still we are definitely nowhere in import substitution. We are somewhere in between being self-sufficient and becoming an export-oriented economy, at least in terms of rolling stock. Because if you see this year, India surpassed China as the highest 
population, uh, popular, most populous nation in the world. And the way our country is structured, the majority of the jobs, education institutions are all centered around big cities, which is leading to concentration of population in these major cities. So there's a big problem to solve in India itself. And that kind of problem, if you see, can only be solved through our public transport. So railways itself has a huge role to play. If you, I mean, not to compare, but uh, uh, most developed cities in the world, like London, Berlin, they are where they are because they have solved the, or to major extent, their public transport and the last mile connectivity of it. So I see India also has a huge opportunity uh, where rolling stock can add value. And in the process of it, we are also gearing up towards adding value to, to, the, to the world. Thank you. Uh, so you talked about population, and I was reminded, maybe about 15, 20 days back, I saw this cartoon in a German magazine. And it said, uh, be room, Indian Uber hold China. Which means, and what did it show? It showed an Indian train with people inside, outside, on the deck, here and there, with an Indian flag, overtaking a swanky modern Chinese train with a Chinese flag. Population, India overtakes China. Now, it was in very bad taste, I agreed. But we, have, we should ignore that and wonder as to why we have reached there. So you said something very important, very music to my ears about ownership. So I do believe the thrill of your own, uh, the pride and ownership of having done something can, or trying to do something can make you do 110, 120% more than uh, what you are otherwise capable of, which is not to liking of everyone. We karte hain to ho jate hain badnam, wo katl bhi karte hain to charcha nahi hota. Aaj aapne, aapne stage pe katl kar diya hai Bhagwati sahab, to charcha mein aayenge aap bhi. But anyway, uh, picking up from what you said, that we have achieved world standard, world, world uh, level in certain aspects. I am not too sure about that in rolling stock. Would you, would you... Would you like to say, uh, no, I am asking you, Mr. Mangaldev, where, which are the, no, realistically, which are the areas, rolling stock is a big field, where you think, and you have vast experience in the, uh, in area of rolling stock, where do you think we have reached somewhere near the world, world class and where we need to work much more to go there? Thank you, thank you. I think that's very, very important. Uh, against what are we benchmarking? So, I gave an example of Suzuki and you know, obviously, Suzuki had its own uh, ups and downs in terms of when they used to benchmark against a product made in Japan and used in India and a product slowly and slowly becoming Indian. So, you know, we have seen that. So, I think what we have to do is benchmark against what are we, you know, benchmarking. So, global standards, at least in the metro segment, I would say the standard that we are following are world standards. And where are we in terms of metro? So we have two or three factories supported with the complete design and Indian uh, supply chain and also now carrying out the maintenance, operation and maintenance. So I would say that the, if you look at the Indian metro, which is being put into service at uh, close to, uh, let's say 10 to 12 crore per car at, at today's rate. I think it is a kind of a great performance by either Alstom or even BML or anybody else who is doing in India. Worldwide, what I see uh, is almost like uh, 1.5 million. This is close to 1.1 1, uh, 1 .1 or 1 1.2. So worldwide, you would see the minimum cost of a car, uh, you know, matching the similar standards is close to 1.75 to 1.8 million dollars. So that way I think we have achieved a great uh, benchmark in India. And uh, Indian Railways definitely have created a benchmark and I think you are the best person to uh, address that and uh, we can only you know make comments sitting on the fence. But in the metro segment where we had a great contribution as uh, the companies uh, either 
in India or from outside India to India, I think there is definitely a benchmark that we have created. Thank you. Uh, well, since you brought it up, uh, <laughs> so, so world class is a misused, uh, very badly abused term because there is no benchmark and you just throw a term uh, which uh, nobody really has a clear understanding of. So, as you uh, talked about uh, Vande Bharat, so of course I was the leader of the team which created it. I am the only person perhaps which says that it is not world class. You will have a lot of discourses saying that it's a world class train and uh, without realizing as to how you define world class because I know specific area which makes a train. The first thing that you, come, uh, that you see is the exterior and the exterior of the train is uh, not world class. Interiors of the train are not world class. They are much better than what we used to make earlier. That's the only thing you can say. So if, you, if we fool ourselves in saying that we have already reached world class, then we'll never reach world class, whatever that be. I'll pose the same question to you, Mr. Ganguly. Which are the synergies and energies where we are very much near, if I permit to say world class again, or top of the class, and which are the areas? And I'm not talking about your brake system alone, for rolling stock as such. And since you have experience in all the field, and where, where we need to do work more to really come up to the world standard, if I can say. Yeah. So uh, let me try to answer the question uh, in a slightly different way. So I think Mangal very aptly touched upon the topic that India is a very price sensitive market. So when India is a very price sensitive market, it becomes very, very difficult to get the best technology, let's say world class at that particular price point. And that's always been a challenge uh, wherever I have worked in my career, be it in building a metro train or building equipment now for locomotives or the locomotive itself. So if you really see what uh, Mangal said, the prices of a metro rolling stock in India is half the price of what it is in the US, for example, even lower. The price of rolling stock is 20%, 25% lower than what we see in China. So when we are trying to supply equipment for that rolling stock to our customer, our customer is already selling it at a very low price. What we really need is an upgradation of the specification and the focus on life cycle costing, if I can really say that. And if the life, and we are moving there, as we also heard uh, Mr. Keshav earlier during the day, that the RRTS, which is the first telemetered project in India, they are already moving towards outsourcing of maintenance. And that would give a lot of freedom in trying to bring in efficiencies, getting in technology that will result in, you know, much more competitive as well as passenger comfort and experience will improve. But it will come at a price. So, you know, how do we balance this, uh, these two things is probably the key. Now, just to take a few examples, uh, for example, let's say, let's take air conditioning, for example. Okay, today, you know, uh, we are selling air conditioning systems for Metro with a very high-end specification that you need to meet a specific energy consumption requirement so that the energy bills are low. Just taking a simple example. However, the globally, we have moved to new refrigerants, we have moved to green filters so to reduce emissions, etc. Now, obviously, we have the vision, let's say, in Indian railways to move to zero carbon emissions by 2030. But what is the price that we are prepared to pay for it? Okay, so this is probably the challenge uh, that we are facing as an industry. And hence, you know, we always, while trying to bring in a technology, always keeping an eye on the price. The world has moved over, let me take another example of locomotives. Okay, we have moved over to, let's say, hydrogen fuel or a battery-powered electric locomotive. But today we are still into high hotspot in India, just moved to it. With Siemens getting the 9,000 hotspot locomotive awarded. Otherwise, we've been on the 6,000 hotspot locomotive technology forever. And fortunately, as again uh, Mangal said, Indian Railways has been smart enough to arrive at a model and also get the price from Siemens, a multinational company, at a very, very cheap price point. So again, how do you really offer a technology that's uh, going to be, let's say, next level? You're only going to meet the requirements of a tender specification. So that's the reality. Now, how do we navigate the situation? What else can we do in terms of linking it to a life cycle cost? whether the OEMs of the systems can also be married for the entire life cycle of the, of the coach or the locomotive or the train set. I think that can bring in 
a little bit of technology differentiation and get in also global technologies much faster into India. But we were fixated on only the, uh, the initial costing and we only bothered uh, about getting in a world-class train, but at a very cheap price point, I think it's going to be a little difficult. Yeah, so partially, I mean, you seem to be saying what I say otherwise is because technology, uh, I didn't finish it. You clapping for Mr. Ganguly? <laughs> so, uh, so, so it's chicken and egg. Technology really cannot have a cost. Technology has so many opportunities and so it has a cost which cannot be worked out on the back of an envelope. Uh, so, and we are not able to afford it in the larger span of Indian Railway, so to say. So, what's the alternative? To create, create your own technology as far as possible, unless the gap is too large. And that brings me to Mr. Bhagwati, because uh, I asked you a generic question earlier. We would, before we close this and throw the, throw the subject open to the audience for questions. You may like to give examples of your company as to what they're doing in this field, yes. Sure, sure. Thank you. So, before I start, I'd also strongly like to second the point which both the speakers made. I mean, price is really a very important topic in how do we bring in new technology and change and move towards world-class standard. I think even more important is that we need to change the mindset from just looking at upfront cost, the complete life cycle cost and the complete value that a product or technology or material brings in over. So I think that shift, if it come, comes, automatically we'll see that over the period, including all the your POH and IOH cycles, if we see, the overall cost is actually not very high uh, if we move to better technologies. And that's something which has been proven again and again, both globally and there are a lot of uh, examples in India also where that has happened. So this is a sm small point. And then uh, I move to what we do as uh, Tata Steel. So the moment we say Tata Steel, everybody <laughs> remembers that for more than 100 years now, we've been making only steel. However, I represent a new and very young division within Tata Steel called New Materials Business. We just started four years back. So the idea was, Steel is a very cyclical business. So the prices go up and down because of factors which are not always in our control. control. So the idea and also the way uh, the world is shaping, uh, the consumer trends are changing, like automotives, which are one of the biggest consumers of steel. Now they are moving to lighter uh, materials because of uh, EV and so on. So keeping all these in mind, our management decided we need to uh, slowly transition from being reliant on just one material to being a more multi-material solution while targeting the same uh, product uh, segments, not that any material will enter. So we have looked at adjacent materials to steel, structural materials like FRP composites. It's something that we are uh, delivering right now. Apart from it, uh, carbon fiber is something we are looking at. Uh, is the, it's in the pipeline. We have not started manufacturing anything yet, but it's something we are developing. And maybe a few years down the line, we'll be able to provide that. Uh, so we started initially with that, and so our focus mainly is on the interiors as of now. We have focused our uh, supplies, uh, solutions, mainly towards the interiors of uh, rolling stock. Apart from it, uh, when we entered interiors, we realized that in order to achieve uh, semi-high speed or higher speed trains like Vande Bharat, we also need to work on the seating systems, which will make them a lighter weight. So that is the next product we introduced just uh, last year. Uh, where we tied up with the uh, original suppliers, Fansa, as a technology supplier, we help uh, design. So, uh, I'll, I'll, yes, sir. I'll, I'll intervene because you mentioned EV, right? Yes. And it's uh, in a way connected with Tata because it may not yes. be your field at all, but yes, th there is a bit of an angst there. And uh, so, Mahindra, Tata, or um, uh, Leyland. The heart of your buses is the engine. Yes. Yes. There is no engine in the EV. So I don't know how much heart you really have in this <laughs> e-bus business. Because fame one, fame two and so on. And out of 18 lakh buses today in the country, all we have is 5,000. Maybe it's going to go up, but 5,000 in seven years is quite a pity. And whatever we have for 12,000 horsepower, we have the converter made in India. 
for yes. 6,000, for yes. 9,000, for whatever, train yes. set, train 18, Vande Bharat. Yes. But for your EV, all the converters, the heart of the system, the motor, the converter, the batteries, of course, I can understand because of all that comes from mainly China and other yes. places. Yes. Would you like to speak about it or it's a subject you wouldn't like to touch uh, upon? No, I, I would very much like to touch upon it, just that I'm not competent enough to talk about it because it's a... Uh, separate wing, Tata Motors, who, so, who handles uh, it. I just wanted to add there, it's not... See, we must realize that private companies have a bottom line. Yeah. The only company, if I can call it that, is government which has no bottom line. And it's a big spender. Yeah. So it should spend in a manner that companies can work uh, comfortably and they, without their bottom line getting disturbed. That has to be strengthened. After all, the government is the biggest, by far the biggest spender. Yeah. And uh, that spirit of Aat Nirbhar has to be encouraged by also... Yeah. Uh, no, it's no good blaming the private companies that enough R&D is not done. Because the spender is the government. Uh, so, I just brought it in. Yeah, and uh, at this stage, uh, uh, let me take a dig at Mr. Mangaldev and Mr. Uh, Ganguly. Is, uh, and that is, uh, again, that old wine which is uh, Mere. मेरे शेर आईना खाने में तेरी बेशुमार अदाओं के। I can go poetic about your beauty, but there is some elegance, some style of your beauty which I will not reveal to you। मेरे शेर आईना खाने में तेरी बेशुमार अदाओं के, मगर मगर ऐसी भी है कोई अदा जो रहेगी सीना इराज में। which means there is certain certain things which will remain in the buried in the recesses of the heart of Mr. Ganguly and Mr. Mangaldev, and you are not going to get access to that on this platform. Uh, so I invite questions from the audience. Uh, you, yes, yes, sir, Mr. Suri. Yeah, after this, sir, uh, can I, can we give a mic to Mr. Suri here? And uh, please. Uh, Please direct a question to one of the okay. one of the three, sir. Okay. Or you, you, don't, you. you don't want to take a question, eh? Okay. No, I, I can, sir. Okay, no. okay. He's going to direct okay, it to you. SK Suri, retired general manager, rail coach factory, Kapurthala. Something directed at Mr. Pritam Ganguly. He, as well as his MD, lady MD, they have all along been advocating that the Indian Railways should place orders based on the life cycle costs. Okay, they have been using, uh, saying it repeatedly in all platforms. Okay, the tenders for Vande Bharat coaches, which have been invited, they cover the initial cost plus maintenance for 35 years, which is the life of a coach. So, is Mr. Pritam Ganguly happy? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Suri, for asking the question in the forum. Of course, I'm happy, but partially happy. Because, you know, <laughs> the reason why I say it's partially happy, it's a step in the right direction because you are marrying not only the rolling stock car builder, but also the supplier. Now, the question is, what is the model of maintenance the rolling stock car builder is going to follow? So, there are three parts. I won't be very long. I'll just try to be brief. There are three parts of a maintenance scope. First is, you have to, over the life cycle of 35 years, post the warranty of the last train, which means it's a project of some 45, 46 years, you will have to have an obsolescence management plan, so that's the spare part supply over that long period of time. The second is the overhauling. Okay, so depending on how you design first, your capital cost could be higher, but you could be more efficient. So instead of overhauling something in nine or 10 years, which we could be doing for Indian railways, we could look at systems which are expensive upfront, but the overhauling frequency will be higher. So this satisfies us. The third part is some work that will be outsourced. It's not, it's not going to come to be, it's not going to be the entire maintenance of our systems to be done by us. Because it's not only needed, but also if you see the price points that the rolling stock car builder has got, it's very competitive. And we've not lived through such a 35 year life cycle costing before in India. We also don't have, to be very honest with you, the experience of this Vande Bharat train set running for too long to know what the maintenance costs really are for our systems. So having said all these, uh, uh, as Mr. Mani said, we have to be positive about it. It's a step in the right direction. And if we are given the entire ownership of the 35 years, if you win the 
subsistence from the car builders who have won it. I think uh, it's definitely going to help in, uh, help in bringing in better technology up front with a better life cycle costing uh, and uh, time will tell uh, what technical uh, uh, solutions which we can propose that will be accepted by the car builders. So, uh, sir, uh, okay, sir, partially happy Mr. Ganguly <laughs> because uh, इस तंग ये दिल का गिला क्या ये वो काफिर दिल है ये तंग ना होता तो परेशान होता means it's very difficult to please him sir but he is half pleased uh, नमस्कार सर uh, yeah. I have one question I am Dr Jagdish uh, yeah hi so my name is Alok Swaranshri we had connected earlier if you recollect yes so I have questions for all the three gentlemen sitting on the stage right. it's a very simple question I think Swaranshri actually mentioned you know, very big words of innovation, Atmanirvar. Look, you're talking about railways, we, which, which hasn't turned a turtle in the past 150 years, right? And this is the first attempt which Mr. Suranshu has, uh, Suranshu has actually taken in actually making something move in, in, the, in the ecosystem. Starting today, which is 2023, you just seen the past one year of some kind of movements and innovation or some kind of developmental infrastructure. What do you think real innovation is, uh, is all about when it comes to Indian railways? From a perspective of how you have actually seen the past one decade of the startup evolution of the country, where you have seen, feel, felt and lived the entire ecosystem of innovation, you know what actually it means and you actually have felt the outcome and the fruits of Atmanirbhar Bharat, right? Take for the sa sa uh, sake of sir, UPI. I, we got your question. Yes, thank now, you. Uh, let me choose uh, the person who would reply because the most neutral person here in respect of Indian Railways would be Mr. Mangal Dev. So, would you like care to yes. reply to his question? <laughs> Thank you. You know, to bring in innovation and manage the complete uh, Atman Nirvarta, I think we, as I said, you know, we have a huge potential, but we have not come together. We have not come together, you know, both Indian Railways as, uh, you know, the overall... Um, not only the manufacturer but also you know who operates and maintains the trains but also the industry and we can blame on so many things in the past and uh, i give you know one example you know always i make a reference and maybe you know you guys will agree that railway is quite a uh, partnership uh, between the private and the public sector and i see some success stories in uh, germany or in France or in Italy or in Japan where both the government and the private sector where the ecosystem developed together hand in hand. So they supported each other without, you know, doubting but building a trust. So can we just look back in India and, you know, identify was there any such uh, attempt? I think only very recently I gave an example of um, metros, you know, uh, of course this was more like the overseas companies, multinational coming in, setting up the shop and then, you know, creating an ecosystem. But I think truly in the past we have done uh, technology transfer, so-called technology transfers, uh, you know, starting from the ALCO and the EMDs and the ABBs. But I always believed, you know, when I became a little bit knowledgeable, interacted with railways, I believed that, you know, the massive bandwidth spectrum that railway is, one single person, one single company cannot do it. You know, whatever funds, uh, skills, manpower or whatever they can bring in. It's a combined effort and maybe, you know, we have to look back and see, did we really do all that is required to be Thank done? Thank you. I think that, yeah. that, that was a uh, very sir, concise answer. I have a small answer. question. Uh, so the lady with the whip is here, so sir, we will take just, one. Just one, one question. One last question, yes, was the gentleman, uh, please. I'm Dr. Jagdish Shivhare. Uh, you are welcome to interact with the panelists uh, of the yeah. platform. Yeah. And yes, uh, sir. I'm Dr. Jagdish Shivhare, uh, professor and ex-scientist ISRO. Sir, uh, according to a survey, our country has the capability to create 40 million well-paid jobs by 2025 and 80 million by 2030. So my question is, how many millions jobs will be given by the Indian Railways and Allied Industries by 2025 and 2030? Uh, the question is for, uh, you have a favorite panelist here? Sorry? Hello, hello. This is a very general question, just I want to Anyone know. Anyone can answer. Anyone can answer. 
Yeah, because uh, it's your question is so heavy on numbers because I can see everyone taking a back seat, but the youngest here is Mr. Bhagwati, so I pass it on to him. <laughs> I mean, asking yeah. such numbers is yeah. a little unfair, so you don't need to t talk numbers. You you can you can you know generally answer the question. No, uh, absolutely. So I think the key uh, that we have seen there's a change that has come over the last couple of years and it's not just in rolling stock. Overall, uh, the way the country is progressing, uh, Make in India is certainly one of the key, uh, uh, I mean drivers right from the uh, government of India which is bringing about a lot of change which is creating a lot of uh, not just industries take up uh, and set up facilities in India but also a lot of entrepreneurs that, that are coming up. So uh, when we look at the kind of opportunities that is being created, and again, uh, the, one of the sore points which I touched initially was the population, uh, the growth of it, so every challenge also brings about an opportunity. If we also see India is today also the biggest market in itself. The consumer base that we have in India is unbelievable. So to looking at all these opportunities together, it's not just the companies that, that will be creating jobs, not just the government that will be creating jobs, there will also be entrepreneurs who will be encouraged to, to take, take up. Uh, I cannot exactly give up a number, but I certainly see uh, it going in a very positive di direction. And the more this takes up, the more see, success breeds success. When you see some companies doing well, creating more jobs, whether it's entrepreneurs or companies, it will breed more people to come up and take up and create such opportunities. Thank you. Uh, so how, how over, to, over to the MC here, because we have Thank burst you. our time. Well, uh, as I said earlier, that the scope of conversations is always open. So we can have a one-to-one -one talk. Uh, before we move forward, can we all put our hands together for all the panelists and moderator, everybody? Thank you. All right, so now uh, here comes a small token of gratitude from our side to uh, all the speakers here. And I would request Mr. Bhardwaj Bhagwati to kindly felicitate all the speakers and moderator. Can we have the mementos, please? We're going to start with Sri Mangal Dev Ji. You all can raise and come forward if possible. Uh, we're going to start with Sri Mangal Dev. Yeah, we all can come in front. So this memento has the name titled as Sri Mangaldev. After him, we would love to have the memento for Mr. Uh, Preedam Ganguly. So can we have the memento for Mr. Ganguly as well? Yes, yes, sir. And we're going to have a token of gratitude for uh, the moderator we had uh, in this panel, because of whom we would, uh, we had uh, a lot of information, of course. It's always the matter of the questions. And he is none other than Sri Sudhanshu Mani Ji. Can we have the memento for him? And give a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, to him. Also, we can have a group photo once we are done with the mementos. Thank you. Can we have a group photo, gentlemen? Yeah. What a powerful session to recall. It was truly very, very fruitful time with all of you. Thank you so much. Once again, a round of applause, everyone.